I'd like to thank our youth, and I would like to thank Dominique for working with our youth. When you read the newspapers and um, you hear the stories, it is so easy to forget that God works always through the most unlikely of vessels. And so as we hear our young people sing, and as we see our young people challenged in what it means to live a Christian life, this is something that at all times, at all times, we should remember because it teaches us that there is no vessel too low in the eyes of the world, that there is no person too humble, that there is no one who cannot be used as a vessel of God to communicate his truth, his grace, his righteousness, and to help usher people into a place of worship. That is the call that's on each and every one of our lives. Our scripture for today comes from Ephesians chapter 5. If you could please find Ephesians chapter 5. We will be focusing on verses 8 through 14. But I want to read verses 1 through 14. Living in the light means discerning and exposing our darkness. Living in the light means discerning and exposing our darkness. If you have found Ephesians chapter 5, please stand to your feet. We will read it together as we do. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to listen to the very words of God. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, and thank you for your holy truth. And God, I ask that as I have prepared, that, Lord, you would take the menial preparation I have done and allow this word to go forth with power by the true strength of the Spirit, because he is the one that allows for all things to be true and for all light to shine. Father, would you help me submit to your will and your guidance and your love? Amen. And you may be seated. It's interesting how Paul begins this particular section of Scripture because he starts off by saying in verse 8, you were once darkness. That's different than most of us probably think of ourselves with regard to our former way of life. For those of us who have claimed Christ, we probably look at what we were before differently. We maybe think of ourselves as, well... I kind of knew about God, 
but I was just doing some wrong things. And the way that Paul phrases it here is not that you were in the darkness, not that you were surrounded by darkness, not that you couldn't see through the darkness, but that you yourself were actually darkness. That there was no place of light within you. There was nothing that was beautiful. There was nothing that was good. You were yourself darkness. And most of us don't look at ourselves and our former way of life that way. I know I certainly didn't. I, I mean, I grew up in a kind of a nominally Christian home. We went to church for probably the first eh, 10 years that I was alive. It was a nice Unitarian church in, in Massachusetts. And, and not Unitarian Universalist, but Unitarian, another Christian sect. And many of us here who grew up in the church go from this point of view saying, well, I was always a Christian. I grew up a Christian. There's nothing else I know but being a Christian. And yet, there is a point at which even those who grew up in the church have to have a moment of recognizing that until you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, you were simply darkness. That there's no place in which you were coming up where because you had a Christian mother or father or grandmother or grandmother or aunt or uncle or friends or the preacher's kid or whoever you were, that because of those things that you were therefore a light of any kind in any way. Now there are some people who have dramatic changes in their lives. If you go over to our house, Pastor Edwin's church. You will meet over there a bunch of drug addicts, prostitutes, pushers, pimps, and everything else who've had dramatic changes in their lives. And they can go, this was the moment. Like there was a day where I knew I was doing something wrong, and there was a day when I knew I was doing something right. And that's a hard line in their life. I, while going to church for a while, walked away from the church for a long, long time because I was never actually in the church. He's like First John says, I went out because I was never one of them to begin with. And so later on in life, in my late 20s, I finally came to Christ here in this church, sitting over in that pew right over there. And that began a process and a change. And that makes it easy for me to go, there was a period that I know what that period was. And it doesn't mean, trust me, that all of that darkness that was in my heart and my mind went away immediately. Trust me, it stayed around for quite a while and enjoys knocking on my door every now and again to remind me of just who I was. But there's an especially great challenge, I think, sometimes for those who have grown up in a Christian community who kind of lie to themselves and say, I wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as you thought it was. It was worse. We all think, well, I wasn't quite that evil, but you were. You were just that evil. Every single one of us comes from a starting block of zero. Zero light. Zero light. You are like when the power goes out in the building here in the church and someone needs to go down to the boiler room in order to turn on the switch. No light. There's no light. It's not even like if we turn off all the lights in here and kind of, and it would maybe be dawn or dusk, so there's a little light coming in. There's no light. No light at all. To do the deeds of darkness means that we show that we have no idea of who God is. Well, does Paul talk about them? Funny you should ask. Yes, he does. If you look up just a little bit in chapter 4, taking up at verses 17 through 19. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now, how is Paul going to describe what the futility of non-believers, that's what he means by Gentiles. He doesn't just, just mean those who are not Jews. He means those who do not believe. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Notice how he puts it there. That all of those things come about because of the hardening of their very own hearts to God. And having lost all sensitivity, 
They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. If you were to truly reflect on your time before Christ, the time before you knew Christ, you would find a person who was never, ever satisfied with the depravity that they had just enjoyed in their sinful self. You would find someone who was always hungering for more. You're like an addict. You're trying to tap that vein to get just one more hit. Because you want just that one more push so that you can enjoy the rush again. And not only, this is what Romans talks about, not only does you, do you do that, but you approve of others who do it and you try to drag others down with you. When I go back and I reflect on my college experience, and the person that I was through high school and college, I, I look back at a, at a young man who, who started drinking when I was a sophomore in high school. I remember the pep rally I skipped out on in order to go over to a friend's house and get completely wasted for the first time. I then reflect on the guy who, just a couple months after that, started smoking marijuana and doing a whole lot of other stuff I had absolutely no business in the world doing. And the thing that I wanted to do with the good people who were around me was drag them down with me. I wanted to get, I was dating someone at the time who was literally a preacher's kid. She was a good kid. And one of my goals was to try to get her to curse. It sounds so simple, but it's, and I would say little things like, do you even know how to curse? She'd say, yes, I am familiar with the words. Well, curse for me. No. Come on. It's just a word. I know you don't believe. Just say the word. No. Now, obviously, there were some issues in her own life because she was willing to date the happy little pagan. But, <laughs> but let's be honest here, I'm a whole lot of cute. And, um, <laughs> and charm and all of those good things. So I'm easy on the eyes. There used to be a lot less of me to be easy on the eyes before. So it was a good time. You know, and I was a decent fellow. And that's the thing that we lie to ourselves about. We, we lie about saying, well, I'm a decent fellow. I'm okay. I'm not that bad. What I'm doing is not that dark. It is. It really, really, really is. It's really that awful. It's the type of thing that if you were to think of it now, you should want to throw up. It should make you sick to your stomach. Let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. Has your sin ceased to shock you? Has your sin ceased to shock you? Do you kind of give it a, oh, messed up again. Has your sin ceased to shock you? Has there ever been a moment where you've looked back on the person you were before Christ? or even maybe the person you were as you've been in Christ and broken down, weeping, because you've actually thought about what you did and who you represented. But Paul's call is a great thing because as he's here, as he's in this moment of saying you were once darkness, that's who you were, there's redemption. But now... You are light. You see, you were all those things. You were all those things, but now you are light. As much as you were darkness, as much as you were evil, as much as you were sin, you now are just as much light. You are light, not in yourself. This is what Paul is great to point out here. You are light in the Lord. If you are in the Lord, then there's light. If you're in yourself, then there's still darkness. But if you are in the light, then you are in the Lord. And so the call then is to follow. And what does it mean to be light? Well, he lists here these fruits. They're fruits of goodness, righteousness, and truth. And the surprise that should be to us is that as bad as we were, as bad as we were, guess what God did? He went in and totally changed it. 
He went in, and as bad as you were, he made you as good as you could possibly be. He took you from as... Do you remember, just if you... The, a good friend of mine posted a great picture on Facebook, like, last week. The piles of snow that were around last week here in the city, before the nice new white snow that came over the other day, right? And you see that snow. It's been sitting there for a couple of weeks. And it's had exhaust and everything else kind of come on top of it. All of a sudden, and, and she took a picture of it. She, descri she described it as the dead, decaying carcass of winter. <laughs> These black as soot, hard pieces of ice and snow sitting, and they are the dead carcass of winter. As much as you were the dead carcass of winter, you are now the very light of God shining out into the world. Now that's a transition. That's a change in self. That's a new day dawning. If you are looking at the world to see goodness, righteousness, and truth. The move from darkness into light should be a shock to our systems. And we should be seeing the world now through an entirely different lens than how we just saw it a little while ago. I was introduced to a, a wonderful new um, uh, not-for-profit that's out there, a foundation that's called 202020. And if you go on to YouTube, you can see a video. And what 202020 does is there's a, a, a Dr. Wang. He's an ophthalmologist, or an opt I guess an ophthalmologist. And there are, the goal is to get 20 million people in the world to have 2020 vision in a period of time. Because most people who are blind, there's a very simple thing, which, an operation which can be done to give them sight again. And so for $300, $300, you can help to get someone vision somewhere in the world. And Dr. Wang described the process. He said, the problem is that uh, part of their cornea is, is not good. And so what you do is you give them a new cornea. You take out the old one, you put in a new one. And apparently the cornea is about the thickness of a piece of saran wrap. And so what you do is you then cut the cornea that's there in half, and you're able to, I, I don't get it, that's fine. I'm not, thankfully, I'm not doing the surgery. But they, and then people are able to see. And one of the pieces that they had on there was a piece about Anita and Sonia. And these are people, two young girls, been blind since birth. And they lived in, it looked to be uh, India or Bangladesh, some place uh, with that kind of a background to it. And they showed this moment of they, the girl, the one girl was easily 14, the other was probably six or seven, the two children. And since the people in this part of the world only make about a dollar a day, they're not going to be able to afford this surgery, even though it's only $300. So this is done as a foundation. They go in, and it's a, it's, it takes about an hour. Well, no, he's, it's about 20 minutes to do the operation, and then about an hour later they can see. I mean, that in and of itself is kind of amazing. But what they showed was these young girls, their parents are working rice fields, or at least that's what it appeared that they did. And they took the girls to this. They did the operation. And, of course, after they do the operation, they have the gauze pads which go over the eyes. And they showed the older one who they took the gauze, and when they took the first eye the first gauze off of her eyes, where she had been blind all her life, 14 years old, never seen a thing. The light shines in for the first time, and her response is, it was this shock. You know, they, they, they felt things before, they've heard things, they've smelled things, but they've never seen anything. Those moments when, when these children, the voice of mom, They've heard for 14 years, and, and for the first time, they see what mom looks like. They showed her out in the fields where they were, and, and now for the first time, the, 
the kind of the wheat that's there, she's, she's looking at it, she's touching it, but she's not kind of, you know, sometimes when someone's blind and, and they'll look off to the side because they can't quite, she's actually looking at it. And now touch connects with being able to see. You see, that's what your movement from darkness into light is. When you have been brought over by the Spirit of God to be in this new place, there should be, a, oh, what is God showing me here? This is what holiness looks like? This is what goodness looks like? This is truth? This is righteousness? I've never seen these things before. But now for the first time in my life, I can't lie to myself about what truth and goodness and righteousness look like because now with the Spirit inside of me for the first time, I actually see it face to face. I actually encounter it, not with my eyes, but with the eyes of Christ shining through me. Of a place of vision that, that no one has ever had before. And here you are. Hopefully, brothers and sisters, you've had that moment. And if you've never had a moment where the clarity and beauty of God's truth and righteousness and goodness shines before you like someone who was once blind and is now able to see for the first time, you need to ask if you've truly been given sight. Do the things of God look beautiful to you? Because if they don't, get your eyes checked. You may not be seeing clearly. If looking on things that are foul and disgusting in God's eyes is appealing to you, you're blind even though you think you can see. What Paul's given here is it's not just a negative reason. He's giving us something positive. He's not just saying, don't do this, but he's saying, do this. It's not God's wrath, but it's his gift of being able, us being able to see. This is very similar to what, he said, what God says through Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 2. The, the great, you know, you, the virgin will give birth. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Jesus, what does he say? You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. If people don't see light shining from you, if you don't actually present yourself as light, not people seeing with light, not people kind of being passive in their life, but you are this light. You are there and you are doing it. And the very fruit that he's talking about here, this is a byproduct of becoming a Christian. It's not a prerequisite. You don't come to God because now you believe in truth and righteousness and goodness. You get saved and then you are able to see for the first time. It's only after light has been shown to us that we can begin to bear fruit. And, and these three qualities, they sum up everything that happens in the Christian life. It's not just knowing that these are the will of God, but testing each and every situation by them. And this is why Paul is able to say, and find out what pleases the Lord. Now that's kind of an interesting thing to say. Because it means that we need to take the knowledge that is in our head and actually, and the change that has happened in our heart, and actually apply it to the day in which we're living. You need to find out. If I asked you to find something, you'd go searching, right? If we had an Easter egg hunt here in the sanctuary, it would be go find the Easter eggs or go find whatever thing it is you need to find. When I lose my car keys, I have to go search for them and find them. But most of us don't take these qualities of God, truth, righteousness, goodness, and actually try to find them in the situations that we're in in life. We're very passive. We think of this as, well, if nothing bad happens, then it was God's will. We think of ourselves as, well, if something good happens, then it was God's will. But we haven't actually taken the time to look at the situation that we're in. Our work, how we raise our kids, how we are in our home, what we're doing with our friends, what we're watching on TV, what we're listening to music, all of those. We haven't actually taken the time to take those things and find out what the Lord's will is for us in each and every one of those situations. We're not doing the heavy lifting that we're supposed to be doing. This is the active part of the Christian life. 
It's coming to these situations and looking at, all right, I'm dating this person. Is God's, where is God's goodness, truth, and righteousness in this relationship? All right, I'm on my job. Where is God's truth, righteousness, and goodness in this job? Where am I showing this? How am I displaying this? And am I keeping focused on the goodness, righteousness, and truth in those relationships, in those jobs, wherever I am, in my home, or am I allowing the darkness to creep its way back in? The tensile strength of a wire is the point at which that wire will break. Now, there's a, a particular element that has been created. It's 100 times stronger than steel. It's called graphene. All right. The tensile strength of graphene is 130, 130,000 somethings, which I don't understand because physics was never my thing. But it's incredibly strong. If you were to take the weight of glory and tie it onto your faith, what is the tensile strength of your faith? Where do you begin to bend? Where do you begin to collapse? Where do you begin to not be able to take on the weight of the darkness that you're piling on top of yourself because you haven't filtered anything through the righteousness, goodness, and truth of the Lord? But what are the fruitless deeds of darkness? Well, that's found in chapters 4 and 5. We just talked about a couple of them. They're being given over to sensuality, indulging in every kind of impurity. They are... Speaking falsehood, this is verse 25 of chapter 4. They're having anger that does not quit. They're stealing. What is it he talks about in verses 3 above that? There must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed. No obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. No immoral, impure, or greediness. All of those things. You see... We have what Paul refers to ha here as fruitless deeds of darkness. We're out there doing stuff, but it's so full of the junk that it bears no fruit. We're doing things. We may be doing things here in the church, but it's so full of junk that it's not actually fruit, no matter what it ends up producing. And here's Paul's hook. Look at what he says back in verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint. Examine your life for a second. Where are the hints of darkness? One of the things that always amazes me is when you are watching a sporting event that's taking place at night. And if you didn't know it was taking place at night because of the stadium lights, you would swear it was happening during the day. That's how bright the lights are that are up all around the stadium. It looks like it's daytime. Until you start moving to the sidelines. And then because the lights are not oriented onto the field, it starts to get a little darker. And when you get up into the stands, it starts to get really dark. Where are you? Are you examining to see where even a hint of darkness has come into the light that you are to represent? Because we're not just speaking about what it is that is being done in the inside or the outside. It's not just your reputation that's on the line here. It's the churches and it's God's. You see, this is what makes, for those of you who have been paying attention at all, Cruffalo Dollar's thing about wanting $65 million for a plane. Besides the practical pieces of it, all right, besides the practical pieces of it, which is that, I mean, it's, it's just, you would be cheaper and more cost efficient to charter an airplane, right? All of those things. Besides the practical piece of it, what was the result of that when it became known? What did people say about the church and about God and about Christ? That's what they're going to say when the darkness is creeping into your life because there's hints there. It's about spiritual awareness. When you are the light of God, 
<coughs> what are people going to see and pick out as the hints of darkness that are there that they can then exploit about the entirety of your testimony? Because what he did shines on all of us. What he did shines on every last one of us. Because we all go by the name Christian. It's the same reason why when we do things that are good, hopefully that pushes back against the evil that was there. But counseling practices will tell you that for every one bad thing you do, it takes five good things to make up for the one bad thing. And unfortunately, over the past hundred years, Christianity has gotten such a bad rap, justified and unjustified, but at the end of the day, the bad rap, that it's going to take a whole lot more good for us to overcome the greed. I mean, look at I mean, what he did. It, it speaks of greed. The very thing the scriptures say to not be about. It speaks so much to greed. $65 million dollars. But the world doesn't look at go, oh, that's just those name it, claim it people and him over there. I know that you nice Baptists sitting over at Central Baptist, you do a good thing. They look at you and they look at him and they say, that's what you all are. You're all that. Is there even a hint of darkness in your life that will destroy your entire testimony? Because if there is, you need to expose it. And that is where the scripture brings us today. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And when you expose them, you expose them with the goal of illumination, not humiliation. It's so that it shines forth, so that light can shine on it. So that you are no longer held down. And if you see a brother and a sister caught up in sin, you confront them about it with love in your heart. The goal is not to beat them down so they feel awful about the thing they did in and of themselves. It's to show them what's wrong so that they may repent. So the feeling that's in them of evil and badness is that of repentance, that they failed God, that they failed the church. And they have a responsibility to confess that and make it known. What is the thing that Paul is dealing with here? Well, we don't write quite know because he says it's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. Paul doesn't even want to talk about it. And some of us are far too easy with the sin that we have in our life. We feel far too comfortable talking about the badness and the evil that we did. This is not to say you don't have people you confess to. It doesn't mean that you don't have people that you talk to honestly about your sin. But we treat it so nonchalantly these days. Because everybody does it, right? So why should I actually look at it as being something really bad? I shouldn't look at it as being that bad. I should look at it as being, eh, it's, it's kind of gray. Maybe 50 shades of them. Let me tell you the sense that I received, and when I try to, because I try to find a way to articulate this, and the, and the best way I can is by going someplace else. Um, uh, a friend of mine put together a documentary on Jesse Owens and, and what he did at uh, the 1936 Olympic Games. And I was watching, there was a clip that was put out on PBS, and so it was online, and so I was able to watch this clip. And my son came up, Robert, came up alongside me while I was watching it. And of course, it deals with the African-American experience in the 1930s. There's a particular word which came up a couple of times, and we know what that word is. It begins with N and all that kind of thing. And it wasn't used in a, in a mean way. But it was more people saying, this is what was said, and it was said here, and this was the thing over here. And, you know, my son is growing up in Harlem. It's not like he's never heard this word before. But he chose that particular moment to say, Dad, what does that mean? You ever been in an awkward situation <laughs> where, especially because, all right, so Robert, um, people who look like your daddy 
would say, at, I mean, that's the type of thing I'm, I'm like, how do I even begin to phrase? How do you, with a seven-year-old at the time, how do you even begin to, but it's an honest question. It needs to be answered, right? How do you even begin to deal with that? There was a shame. Not because I used it derogatively, but because I recognized what the impact of that word was and what it says about people and, and what it means and how it's affected relationships and how it's affected my relationship to the majority of the congregation here, even passively. What it means when I'm walking up in Harlem and, and confrontations, all, people coming against me saying, this is not where you belong. And it comes out of that sort of a dynamic. Even though they don't know me, it comes out of that dynamic. And there's a sense of, uh, I don't want to explain this. I have to explain this, but I don't want to explain this. When you reflect on your sin, there should be a sense of, I really don't want to talk about this. Because you've recognized how dark it is compared to the light. But as we are exposing our sins and as we are confronting them, we need to remember that even if we don't do it here, it will happen. Your sin will be exposed. One of my favorite little Facebook memes that comes up over and over again is the one that says, I'm glad I did all my stupid stuff before the internet was invented. <laughs> so true. If people want to find out dirt on me, they got to go find four by six photographs, scan them, and that's a lot of work for today's youth, so I know I'm pretty safe, right? They won't be able to find the videotape because it's in VHS, all right? Or beta. It's in Super 8, you know? Some of us are so lucky that our bad stuff is on, like, Zapruder film, right? There's not even sound to go along with it, right? It's just a grainy image. I think that's Shirana, but I'm not sure. And I am really glad that the stupid stuff that I did is not able to be out there, but I look at what our people are doing today and what they're willing to share online. How they're so willing to expose their sin. How they are so willing to expose their darkness. How they are willing to take all of the light that could possibly be found in them. And it's so stupid and myopic. It's so short-sighted. I mean, especially with Google. I mean, what job interview do they think they're going to go on where someone's not going to go to Google and go... Jane Smith. Wow. Wow. Christ's light means that we no longer lie to ourselves about what sin is. I know that this section is not talking about unbelievers because unbelievers don't do their sin in private. They do it in public. But we believers, we're really good at putting it in private. We're really good at keeping it on the DL doing it behind closed doors. No one's ever going to see that I did this. It won't show up on my Covenant Eyes report or it won't show up on the internet list. It's not going to show up in the tithes and offerings and, or anything else. Hey, all this stuff, no one's ever going to know. And one of the most dangerous places for us to be in our Christian lives is where sin is just accepted. When we set the bar so low that we say, well, I'm going to sin. Might as well. I can go to God then about grace. If the light of Christ is on us, then we have to be ready to expose our own sins before we expose the sins of others. There may be people in your life that, as we were talking today, they came to mind and you said, you know what? Um, i got to confront this brother or sister because I know they're doing this wrong thing. And I've got to talk to them about it because it's, it's showing darkness in what should be a testimony filled with light. But brother, sister, you need to look at the plank in your own eye before you examine the splinter that's in someone else's. 
The light of Christ has come because Christ has come into our lives and shows us that we are doing the wrong things. And sometimes it's just a little itty bitty teeny tiny thing. In our house the other week, all of a sudden the lights in the back hallway in in our apartment, we don't have a house. I I lied. I confess my lie. We don't have a house. We have an apartment. We have a nice pre-war apartment, but it's it's still just an apartment. But in the back hallway, all the lights all of a sudden went out. And me being the guy I am, you know, I want to be Mr. Fix-It. I want to, you know, try to do right and, you know, and all that kind of thing, right? And so... It, it was, we'll figure out what's going on. So I'm there, and, and we don't have the glass fuses anymore. I, I actually, in a way, kind of miss them. They were very easy to deal with. We have the regular fuse box right now. And so I went back, and I was flicking the switch, and every time I would flick it back to on, it would pop off again. I was like, oh, gosh, all right. Well, it must be that, I mean, those fuses hardly ever burn out, but occasionally they do. So I thought, all right, well, I, it's late at night. I, the only place that I can possibly go to is Home Depot. So I went over to Home Depot, got a 15-amp fuse, went back to the house. This was after becoming an expert in changing fuses by going onto YouTube and watching a guy change a fuse, all right? So I'm 15 minutes into getting my black belt in fuse changing, all right? So here we go. I go to Home Depot, I come back, and I take the old fuse out, unscrew it, Put the new fuse on. So far, not electrocuted. Everything's good. Try finally pushing that fuse back into place and flick the switch. And it pops back off again. It gets a little spark and it pops right back off. I go, man, this is a brand new fuse. This thing has got to be okay. There must be something else. So went into the back of that. We had already turned off all the lights to make sure that there was no you know, draw on electricity that was coming through the fuse. We had turned off all the lights as best as we could. You know, when the lights go off, you can't remember which lights you left on and which lights were off. And so you're going, I think this one was on, but I may be turning it off, so at least let me turn it down. All right, so finally did all that. It kept flicking on and off. What was it? In my son's room, he had hooked up a little uh, MP3 player, which was just kind of hanging out of the outlet. It was in just enough to complete the circuit and out just enough to blow the circuit. So I was sitting there and I pulled that one thing out. That was the only thing that was not plugged in in the back of our apartment. Went over, flick, lights come on. Brothers and sisters, there may be one little itty bitty thing in your life which is keeping you from truly being the light of God in this world. You need to find it, you need to unplug it, and you need to start over again so that you can actually follow the life of Christ in here. Do not glory in your darkness. Do not excuse the darkness that is in your life. You need to expose it by the light of Christ, because you are a new creation in him, and this opportunity to shine light into the dark areas of your life begins right now. Let's pray. Father, in your glory and in your goodness, you provided us with something we never had before, and Lord, that is light. Lord, we are finally, for the first time in our life, able to see And Lord, we are finally, for the first time in our life, able to know what is truly dark. Help us, Lord, to live by light. Lord, to have the courage and the trust in your grace to expose our darkness so that there is no place, no place where we let the light hide. Father, would you be with us? Amen.